Hello and thank you for joining us today for Prime Vigilance's webinar on Providing Global Medical Information Locally, hosted alongside Pharma Focus. My name is Angela Cottrell and I'm the Editorial and Events Director for pharmaceutical publishers Samadan Limited, whose portfolio includes the monthly newspaper Pharma Focus and its sister website pharmafile.com. Prime Vigilance, part of the Ergomed group of companies, focuses on providing high quality global life cycle management services with over 600 in-house employees, supporting pharmaceutical, biotech and generics companies in managing their products' global drug safety. In today's webinar, we are joined by Prime Vigilance's Head of Medical Information, Amina Balyij. She will be sharing and summarising key considerations for effective customer management, which stakeholders should consider when providing medical information. Amina will also focus on how to adapt local specifics into a global team, while ensuring that all relevant regulatory requirements are met. Examples of practical case studies will be used to illustrate the methods used to achieve the results. Just a few points before we begin. You are welcome to submit questions for Amina at any point during the webinar, and she will try her best to answer as many as possible during the question and answer session at the end. If your question is not answered in the running time, we'll make sure you receive a response afterwards. The webinar will be made available for download on demand within a few days. I'd now like to hand over to Amina to open the webinar. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as I as, uh, mentioned, my name is Amina and I head medical information at Prime Vigilance. Medical information is actually one of the key um, components of life cycle management because it's one of the areas where spontaneous um, case reports would come in from a pharmacovigilance standpoint. So Prime Vigilance prides itself in collaboration with Ergomed in providing the full um, life cycle management from clinical trials all the way to post-marketing, uh, including medical information. On today's agenda, I'd like to talk to you about the role of medical information as well as the global and local structure and how you as an organization or as a service provider are able to work with you and in collaboration um, to make sure that your patients feel supported. So some disclaimers. Um, the views and opinions are that of myself and should not be attributed to Prime Vigilance or Ergomed, its management, employees, contractors, or clients. Um, their intellectual property uh, of uh, myself and, and uh, are protected under copyright laws. These disclaimers are always a fun part of any presentation. <laughs> and uh, jumping right in to the role of medical information. Um, as I previously mentioned, medical information is one of the key components of life cycle management. It usually falls in right before the um, approval of a medication. So when you're setting up your, your system to be able to support whoever is calling in to request samples or request medical uh, science liaison um, attendance or further information, all the way to discontinuation and past. Because what we find is that people, even though the drug is discontinued, they still want support. So medical information provides answers to customers, and that'll be all of your customers. So that'll be your key opinion leaders, that'll be your sales reps, that'll be your uh, patients, as well as other healthcare professionals and pharmacists, as it relates to the product or disease. Medical information tailors, so patients, for example, would not get a lot of information about the disease state. Uh, however, a healthcare professional would. Uh, medical information is not in place to provide medical advice because ultimately we don't know the patient, we don't know their medical history. So our role is just to provide answers and clear uh, information for a healthcare professional to be able to make a decision on patient health. Medical information also monitors trends, um, off-label use and potential for therapeutic expansions. We've seen this many times in the medical information field where um, a product is approved for a very particular indication. However, over time, you get the phone calls of, um, you know, it's not really working that great uh, for my hair loss, but let me tell you, I've lost 15 pounds in the last four weeks and I've changed nothing on my diet. So medical information is one of the key areas where the expansion of therapeutic uh, indication would come into play. What happens in post-market is definitely not what happens in clinical trials. As you're aware, clinical trials are very um, restricted, so it's a very specific specific patient in a very specific disease state using very specific products and medications. However, when it comes to the real world, people do things like um, interesting things, like um, they go 
go on vegan diets, they decide to go on juice cleanses, and all of that has an impact on the medication and how it works. Clinical trials cannot account for everything, so medical information is where we would monitor any of these trends. And we're the first ones to notice change. Um, we'll notice decrease in calls which could potentially mean a decrease in sales, which means it's a good indication for the sales team to start thinking about a marketing campaign. And then we'll also start uh, seeing increase in call frequency regarding product issues. Medical information tends to be the first area where we identify quality complaints. For example, if um, you have a product that's in, um, that, there's a, that are pills and they're actually in, in a foil, and um, the quality department, due to the fact that these, this new foil is now better for stability, changes the foil. But then when it gets to the real world, people have a hard time popping their pills out of their uh, packaging. So we'd be the first ones to find out about these, uh, these issues, medical information. And then we would triage that um, within the quality department to make sure that these issues are addressed. So how does medical information do what they do? Um, in order to be able to provide the best customer service, we implement call scripts. These will be very clear definitions of what to answer, how to answer, and the type of questions that we see. So call scripts would address the most important um, and most frequent questions. And then we also develop tools such as frequently asked questions or FAQs, uh, as well as standard response templates. FAQs tend to be um, documents that allow us to answer uh, questions that come up frequently, such as more more frequently we started to see questions such as, um, is it vegan friendly? And is it strict vegan friendly? Um, is it kosher? Is it halal? Especially if there's gluten uh, in the product. We also do a lot of cross-functional involvement, as mentioned previously. Um, we review common complaints with quality. So a medical information tends to usually be invited to any kind of quality council where quality trends are discussed and monitored. Um, we, adapt, we elevate um, difficult queries to the medical advisors who then request medical scientific liaisons um, to reach out and speak with those particular healthcare professionals. We liaise with medical scientific liaisons, especially when they're requested. Um, we triage safety and quality information. So medical information, as I mentioned, is, is the first touch, so this is where all the spontaneous cases come through. So from a pharmacovigilance perspective, these cases count as more because people tend to um, associate that particular product with that event, so causality is implied. So medical information is one of the key areas where we can get, identify as much information as possible for case processing. The same for quality information, um, just getting somebody to tell us, you know, the, the the product's not working or I can't open the bottle it doesn't really help the quality department. So the medical information department through the call script as mentioned earlier uh, is able to gather as much information as humanly possible or as available uh, in, before triaging into the relevant departments. We also facilitate connection with customer service. Medical information is one of the departments that gets queries about availability. Um, whenever you tend to have an out-of-stock situation, medical information be one of the first ones to feel it because they're the ones that get most of these queries. Um, because, as you know, the product um, tends to have the phone number of the manufacturer um, on, the, on the label um, or the market authorization holder, uh, depending on if it's the same one. So the first line of queries for availability would come through medical information, and then we facilitate that with customer service. Um, we also uh, receive legal queries, and we triage that with the legal department. Um, so as you can see, medical information um, tends to work with almost all of the departments in operations. And we also help with quality when it comes to any kind of recalls. Um, any kind of um, recall communication tends to especially be required to be approved by medical information so that they have the right staffing in place to be able to provide all the necessary details um, for all of, the, all of your customers to be able to get their products returned and the product be destroyed effectively. Let me dive in a little bit further into the frequently asked questions. Um, FAQs, as I mentioned before, help standardize responses to customers. They address common questions, as I previously mentioned, such as vegan, gluten-free, um, halal, kosher, um, lactose-free as well. 
they help reduce misunderstanding by customer. So in my previous organization, we actually had a recall um, that we had to standardize through an FAQ in order to be able to reduce confusion by the customer. Um, the instructions in the particular FAQ were that the patient uh, were to destroy the product themselves. Um, however, the communication to the pharmacist wasn't as clear. So in order to reduce the number of queries from the pharmacists, we had a really good FAQ when patients would call in to help them understand what exactly is required. FAQs also help drive quicker response time uh, that help increase the customer satisfaction. In any pharmaceutical company, it's very difficult to become a project expert um, unless you have only have one product. So in order to have a team who's able to speak to everything, we diversify. We have um, people who would only answer one type of inquiry, such as ones that come from FAQs, and then people who would become more specialized, such as the medical advisors in the pharmaceutical industry. So what tends to happen is that if we have really good FAQs, we do not have to transfer um, the call to somebody more experienced, somebody who's an expert in that area, and the medical information for one touch resolution can be implemented. Um, there's also an increase in speed to answer. If you have products that are critical to patient health, um, it's very imperative to have FAQs that are very quickly available for dissemination and for implementation and for communication to the customer. There's times where a complicated query would come in and they take up to five, ten days to complete. Um, and if you're a surgeon who has a patient um, on their surgical table but they're, they're struggling with a particular question, you tend to not have those five to ten days to get a query resolved. So having really good FAQs at start of product marketing really helps eliminate um, the time um, to answer and really helps increase your customer satisfaction. Medical information, as I mentioned, has a huge impact on the customer satisfaction. Um, and as previously mentioned, um, that's done through easily uh, accessible responses such as FAQs. Medical information also tends to be involved in patient assistance programs. Um, we'll dive into that a little bit for uh, dive, dive into that a little bit further on. We help train new customer-facing staff, such as sales reps. Um, and medical information is also the ears of the organization. Um, bad patient interactions tend to decrease customer satisfaction. And I'm not sure how frequently you guys read reviews of particular pharmaceutical companies um, or products or read Facebook about particular interactions. Any kind of bad interaction tends to have a significant impact on the customer satisfaction. Um, and again, from a safety perspective, Pharmacovigilance triaging is one of the key components of medical information. Missed cases can lead to significant safety issues. Um, there are many um, different warning letters by the FDA and um, risk uh, categorizations globally where medical information did not really understand what a safety event is. They then did not forward that safety event to the pharmacovigilance team for processing and issues were identified later on that could have been prevented a lot earlier. If medical information were, were aware of the thalidomide situation before and triaged it uh, appropriately, we might not have seen something as significant as um, the impact it had on the patients. Speaking about the patient support programs, um, as I previously mentioned, medical information tends to be very involved in patient support programs. Um, and patient support programs balance a multitude of needs. Um, they're cost saving for government. They have cost implications for the marketing authorization holder, as they are not inexpensive. Um, however, they provide ease of access for the healthcare professionals, ease of use for the patient, and tend to really focus on therapy compliance. In order to be able to meet um, the needs of healthcare professionals and patients, patient support programs usually encompass a multitude of um, services. So in uh, controlled drug substances or new products, uh, what tends to happen is there's an initiation and a follow-up call. So somebody, either medical information or an actual organization that provides assistance programs, will reach, it, reach out um, 
and uh, initiate the um, product use. Um, patient support programs involve uh, reimbursement, they involve injection services, infusion services, pharmacy services, and delivery services. From an injection and infusion services perspective, uh, medical information would be the key contact because whenever there's an adverse event that has to get escalated to the right departments or if there's any kind of inquiry that comes through. What happens in patient support programs is that patients actually have a healthcare, healthcare professional in their home um, or healthcare professional for whom they have a mobile number or easy access to. So they tend to be a little bit more open. Um, what we've realized is that the medical information team tends to be a lot busier in companies that have large-scale patient support programs because of uh, increased adverse events, increased complaints, um, and uh, increased reactions, especially injection site reactions. So the medical information team is able to really mitigate that by having really good standard response documents that they can provide even to the nursing staff to be able to address any of the patient needs. As I mentioned before, the impact of these patient support programs is significant on resources. Um, in my previous organization, uh, we had a team of two medical information specialists that grew to a team of eight after the patient support program introduction, and it was an injection service for customers who were doing first-time injections. So a lot of questions, a lot of queries, and then once the patient support program ends or people have been weaned off the support program because they've been trained, the calls tend to come through medical information when people are confused or there's something that goes wrong. And because these individuals have had um, a tailored approach from um, a staff member of, a, of the organization, they tend to be more frequent callers. Um, there's also customer management and pharmacovigilance. Um, a lot of customers now expect patient support programs, especially in the North American regions, your healthcare professionals. So in order to be able to meet their needs for prescribing, um, what tends to happen is that in the background, medical information team tends to be very, uh, very aware of who's doing what um, and how they have an impact. And from, an, uh, from a covigilance perspective, you will see a lot of noise, um, again, due to the fact that there is a healthcare professional in the home of a patient. Now we'll talk a little bit about the um, different approaches to medical information. So um, you also have, when we think about um, the setup of a medical information department, they vary from organization to organization. And if you're using a um, third party to provide medical information to you, we always have to look at local uh, regulations and global regulations um, and really weigh uh, the impact of anything that we see and that we do. Um, we'll walk a little bit through what that means in the grand scheme of things, but all of these can be really well balanced um, from a global medical information department. So jumping right into the global team. When you have a global team, the main pro um, I would say is that it's one team. So there's a really good consistency in approach. The team really understands how to answer queries, how to answer the phone, how to escalate, um, how to gather information and where to find it. And therefore, it really increases customer satisfaction. Um, I'm not sure about you, but uh, whenever there's a new person that starts, the onboarding process tends to be comprehensive. And if you have one onboarding process because there's only one team, it's very easy to control. Um, so you know exactly what kind of uh, documents need to, be, need to be trained on. You don't have to really worry about um, differences in procedures. I've been in organizations where the global medical information uh, procedure is very different to the local one, and then there's a question of which actually precedes uh, the other. The costs are controlled. Um, uh, from a resourcing perspective um, and a uh, documentation perspective. So basically, um, with regards to the, the, the cost control, you know exactly what you're spending on um, the medical information team. Um, because it's one global team, they're able to pull, um, if there's, for example, a patient support program that's running for a month in, let's say, the US, but your team is based I don't know, let's say in Canada, why not? Um, 
and you have a team uh, that where they're overseeing the U.S. European uh, medical information. Um, if there's a patient support program, however, there's really very little marketing being done in the U.K. That team tends to be um, easily repurposed to help with uh, U.S. queries, especially because they'd be cross-trained on everything. And from a documentation perspective, because you only have one uh, system, um, it's easier to document um, and, and to purchase licenses rather than individual systems. I'm aware of multitude of um, organizations where locally um, it's a very different tool than in a different um, country. So I've seen um, customers who have, let's say, in the U.S., IRMS, and then they have uh, Viva in the U.K., and they have Aeris's tool, um, AG Inquirer, in Australia. That's three sets of tools, three sets of validation documents, three sets of everything that need to be maintained from a global oversight perspective uh, from a pharmacovigilance standpoint. Another big pro of having one team is that it's on brand. So the brand doesn't vary. If you have a global brand, all the communication is on brand. So it's really well controlled. Um, your customers see only that particular brand and the communication is on brand as well. So there's no variance between um, how, let's say, US approaches that particular product marketing versus the UK. But of course, there's cons. Um, subtle changes have a big impact. Um, I think that's a key takeaway because uh, types of queries vary between territories. Um, North America, because there is less access to a healthcare professional, uh, they tend to be more patient focused. So in North America, we get a lot more patient calls compared to, let's say, in Germany or in France, where it's mostly physicians or pharmacists calling. calling. Um, so the query profile uh, varies significantly, and that with that, the approach varies. Um, North Americans tend to ask for samples a lot more frequently than Europeans. They tend to ask for product replacement more frequently than Europeans, um, especially um, if they don't have a really good insurance plan. Product indications can vary. Um, let's just take the European Union, if you have a centralized versus national approach. I've seen products where in the UK they're indicated for um, one indication, but in Germany they have four. So how would you, as a global team, manage that? Because if somebody, if there's cross-border shopping, for example, somebody calls the phone number and says, but in Germany you're allowed to do it, um, it's a little bit more uh, sensitive of a conversation. Advertising is a big one as well, because in the U.S., um, advertising can be done direct to the consumer, um, which, of course, leads to consumer queries. In, in the U.S., the queries aren't just, is it lactose-free? Queries come in and say, oh, um, I saw the uh, advert. Is it okay if I take it? Um, we, of course, cannot provide any kind of medical advice. Medical information is meant to provide information to the healthcare professional to help uh, a decision on prescribing, but to patients is whatever the healthcare professional has uh, prescribed. So balancing the fact that we have consumers who are quite well educated about side effects and about the purpose of a medication compared to, let's say, in Europe also has to be balanced. Now a little bit about uh, pros and cons of the local medical information team. Now, the local one allows us to adapt to local expectations. Um, it really helps expand the team um, into compliance roles, for example, um, where it relates to marketing or um, compliance from a um, sales rep perspective. The a local um, affiliate medical information tends to have a breadth of opportunities uh, versus a global one. So um, because the local affiliate will have only local queries to manage, usually it's not really um, a large team. So it tends to be usually one or two medical information specialists, depending on the size of the organization and the volume of calls. So um, getting onboarding um, getting them motivated to, to stay and learn uh, allows them to expand 
their particular experience. Of course, it removes errors. Um, not every label is the same. And um, as, as we mentioned before with the indications, but health authorities see reactions differently. Um, and health authorities interpret information differently. If you're familiar with um, the SMPC in Europe, you'll know that it's quite different than the FDA label, which is completely different than the product monograph in Canada. The product monograph in Canada tends to have a lot of pages of side effects versus the SMPC versus the FDA's uh, approved uh, label. So it's um, making sure that, that we answer the patient um, correctly from the correct SPC is really sim much easier uh, from a local expectation perspective. From the cons, as I mentioned before, because it's a small team, resource management tends to be a big problem, um, especially when it comes to recruitment and sick leaves. Um, I mentioned before in, in the beginning where we talked about um, that particular patient support program where it was patients who are um, first time injections. Um, we went from a very small team to a very large team quite quickly. Um, and with a quick uptake, um, we've noticed that we were having uh, training issues because onboarding is managed locally. We were missing procedures or um, we had too many procedures that were really not having an impact on us. So local, um, local medical information tends to have a local um, CRO or a local third party to help support. Um, any kind of, of backfill. Um, there's companies that require 24-7 coverage, um, especially when it's life-saving and life-altering drugs. You need to have somebody available to pick up the phone at any point in time to be able to manage that particular customer's expectation. Let's say in um, a life or death situation, if the product is not opening or if there's a, if there's a malfunction, having somebody available 24-7 um, to walk them through that issue is imperative. Local affiliates cannot, can absolutely not provide something like that. So they tend to partner with more third parties to be able to support that kind of service. Um, and from a branding perspective, um, there's local changes to approach. Um, the way that the product looks, the way that the product feels, the way that the communication looks and feels tends to be a little different. So if it's a strong global brand, um, the local approach has to be really tightly um, overseen. The one thing that tends to impact medical information the most is the fact that there's limited regulatory guideline on how to provide medical information, but it falls very clearly within the pharmacovigilance guidelines. So from a regulatory perspective, um, we tend to focus on the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industry Code of Practice that talks to the product being, um, the, the responses being by, balanced. Where regulations come into play more is usually in medical affairs and medical marketing where there's a very clear understanding of what can and cannot be distributed and provided to healthcare professionals. However, as I mentioned, medical information is firmly rooted um, in the pharmacovigilance guidelines, especially when it comes to spontaneous case reporting, off-label case handling, and provision of information regarding off-label use. As previously mentioned, when it comes to the real world, we cannot control how patients, control, patients and healthcare professionals utilize and, and consume the product. So having a clear understanding on how we provide off-label use so it's not promotional is where medical information really comes into, into play. Now with that in mind, um, when you're looking at a medical information system, be it global or local, depending on your needs, um, the key takeaways would be resource allocation and management. People move on, they want to learn, they want to grow, they win the lottery. How do you manage resources and how do you manage response time? Because the customer is not going to wait for you to hire. The customer is not going to wait for you to train. You need to have somebody available at any point in time to answer these questions. Because if you don't, you're going to lose that particular healthcare uh, professional, that particular patient. And that goes in line with the messaging and branding. So if you have a bad reputation because you're not answering queries. Your branding changes. 
and there's a lot more work that needs to be done to to backfill uh, these particular needs. And then local label variations that you need to really be uh, cognizant of. It can be controlled in the global um, department through version control, through uh, through allowing particular individuals to be specialized in certain countries and their local labeling um, versus local. But then if you're local, odds are you're going to need a lot of support. Any questions? Thank you, Amina, for sharing your presentation. We're now going to move on to the Q&A session. This gives any listeners with a question the opportunity to have it answered today, and we'll try and get through as many as possible. Our first question to um, come in is as follows. Uh, do you believe MI is necessary during the clinical trials period? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we find that sometimes customers who are currently in the phase three uh, trial period that are actually going into marketing and submissions soon uh, that have a very vicious uh, strategy when it comes to sales and marketing um they would like to they re would like to receive support um what i recommend is um after approval up to marketing uh you have actually a setup for people to answer queries um especially specialists they tend to be very educated about what new roles are com what new um technologies out there what new products are out there and just having somebody on the line to tell them, yes, we 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 hear your question, we've escalated your question, we're hoping to have um, these queries to you um, answer to shortly. Um, it'll also allow you to have a really good strategy for your KOL interactions as well as your MSL communication strategy while you are thinking of uh, next steps. Great, thank you, Amina. Um, another question that's come in um, reads, uh, if you have a global organization, how do you address the issue with language requirements? That's also a great question. Um, it all depends on where actually you're based from a global organization perspective. Um, like would have it, people tend to be quite multilingual. Uh, and there's also third-party service providers to, who help translate uh, queries either in line, live, on the phone, uh, that way you could only have a certain number of people that are trained. Um, we find that especially with very specific languages um, that are rarely spoken, let's say a very unique Finnish dialect, or if your marketing strategy is to have availability all over Europe, but you're not really pushing sales in um, certain countries, let's say, um, Ukraine or Poland, however you have a large push in Germany, um, having that third party uh, to help provide the translations is really uh, integral, um, especially if you're if, if you're a small market and uh, you're not really ha you don't really have medical information experts. Um, it really helps having a global strategy on how to address it. My recommendation is also always to try to f to find multilingual staff. It'll really allow you to provide the best services to your customers. Great, thank you. Um, just had another question um, come in. Um, what KPIs and metrics are usually uh, measured for efficiency of an MI department? Um, mm -hmm. And the uh, the question also is, where can I get benchmarks, please? Any advice on that? Yeah. Um, so KPIs and metrics. Would you, what I would recommend for KPIs and metrics is trying to see what works for you. Um, it'll all depend on the size of your team and how you're planning on. Uh, uh, utilizing them. Um, KPIs, what we usually look at is uh, length of query, um, how long it takes to answer a query, especially more complex ones, whether it's literature search that's required, and uh, sometimes even legal approval, depending on how you're structured. So having a clear understanding of the turnaround times um, is integral. Uh, that's usually measured in your database, where you have your open and close. Uh, sometimes you'll have a query, and then you'll have follow-up questions. Um, and 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 just making sure that that you address questions uh, one at a time. Um, other KPIs would also be uh, drop calls. Um, how many times people have dropped a call? Um, sometimes we would also look at, let's say, you have your your market authorization holder, let's say, of generics, and you know that uh, uh, organizations in generic industry uh, they tend to be more 
unspecialized type of uh, questions such as gluten, lactose, um, checking how long that usually takes your team to process um, so that you can take a look, are your FAQs effective, are your team sticking to the script, um, and where are the people guiding the conversation. Medical information professionals tend to be a little bit more chatty, um, which is great, um, but it also can be a problem, especially when you have a a high call volume, uh, so having those kind of KPIs, um, I believe, are integral. Where you can get de benchmarks, um, that's actually a great question. Um, if you have a global organization, you can benchmark against uh, other departments, um, or you can also um, benchmark, lo benchmark locally. Uh, certain uh, affiliates, let's say the US, we know that uh, the queries last a little bit longer. Uh, versus in Europe, Europeans are a little bit more direct um, in their um, question. But I'm going to get, I'm going to circle back to you, um, um, Maria, uh, if you don't mind, uh, with regards to some other benchmarking areas. Thank you, Amina. Um, another question that has come in: um, How can you deal with global MI, uh, where there are many MAHs, but you own the intellectual property? Ha, huh, that's also a great question. Um, what I would suggest for that is actually being in control of uh, you of, of of the information um, that you provide. Um, with regards to uh, the global uh, um, representation, as it relates to when you have a lot of um, MAHs, what I would suggest is having very clear understanding of where your responsibility are, uh, where and where your responsibility ends. Um, in previous organizations, what I've seen is we would escalate internally when it comes to intellectual property. Um, we would ask the MEHs to ask us uh, specific queries where we only have answers. Um, and then we would respond on their behalf. So we would ask them to tell uh, the caller or inquirer to say that you, we'll have somebody reach out to you. Um, other uh, other companies have different approaches, of course. They say, you're the MEH, you own all the information. We can just approve what we know, uh, and that way responsibility is on the MEH. Um, ultimately, the responsibility is on the MEH because when you're looking at adverse events or anything like that, it's that person that's accountable. Um, so it really depends on your agreements and, and the level of control you want to have over the product. Thank you. Um, another uh, listener comments that limited resources seem to be a common issue within MI departments. She asked, mm -hmm. how do you suggest tackling this issue? Any tips? Um, that's actually a very common, uh, very, very common issue. Uh, very work. In my previous organization, what I used to try um, to get my medical information team to be involved in is, let's say, uh, PRAC updates uh, for the European Union. Um, they're very simple changes, but the impact is fairly immediate, especially because these individuals are answering questions depending on what's actually in the label. My suggestion is, is you know, uh, having cross-training, uh, allowing them to do, let's say, 0.15 FTE, different kind of roles, uh, and allowing them to do more interaction. Um, there's also collaboration uh, to do rotations with other departments. PD and MI tend to be quite similar, uh, as well as medical affairs, and trying to see if there's any way to deal with your colleagues to find a way to work together towards a common goal, because ultimately these are internal resources, and you've spent so much time training and getting them into the right culture. Why 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 lose that resource? Why not repurpose? Why not have conversations? Uh, present what medical information means to you and your organization, and then try to figure out if there's any way to build bridges with your quality team, your PD team, or even a regulatory team um, to help align and help them all kind of learn a little bit of everything. Thank you. We've literally just had another question come in here. Uh, in situations where there are various MAHs for the same product, should you have common MI queries, and should you share MI queries? Again, that goes back to your agreement. Um, in previous organizations, we used to have companies, uh, we would sell, let's say, we would have various distribution partners. This this especially comes into play in, in France, um, where the MAH um, tends to be a little different. Um, it really depends on who ultimately the um, database holder is. Let's say if, if you own... Um, the information, um, MI and my answers, yes. Um, it, it, but um, 
as I said, it, it really genuinely depends on the contract that you have and the level of ownership that you wish to have. Um, I've had organizations where there's multiple MEHs say, you know what, we have one company that's responsible and all of us contribute um, with payments for those uh, headcounts uh, and that resource. And from a sharing of MI queries perspective, that's a tricky one because your MI responses tend to be, especially when you're doing literature searches, tend to be more intellectual property of yours um, and, and the information that you hold as a market authorization holder. But my, my suggestion is always having really, really clear understanding of who's responsible for what and what you're willing to share because not everybody's willing to share their information. Very true. Um, well, I think however, that, however, oh, oh, if sorry. I may interject, <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, if it's the same product and you're seeing a product quality issue, please talk to each other. Uh, and you're seeing a signaling issue, please talk to each other. Um, because in medical information is where you will start seeing these, as I, as I mentioned earlier, where you start seeing, it's the pulse, right? So you'll start seeing these queries and these issues. Um, that I would also uh, encompass in your uh, SDEA and your quality agreements, just to make sure that those things are escalated appropriately, if you're not willing to share MI queries. Thank you. Um, we unfortunately do need to wrap up now. Unfortunately, that is all uh, the time we have for questions. Um, thank you again to our speaker, uh, Amina Balyish from Prime Vigilance. Uh, this webinar will be available to download from pharmafiles.com on demand within a few days. I'd be grateful if you can remain connected for a few more seconds and you'll be redirected to our feedback survey where you can submit any comments or any further questions you might have. That's all from us. Thank I'd you. just like I'd just like to say a final thank you to all of our listeners for their time, and I hope you found it useful. I hope you'll join us again for future webinars.